the big sorry, one is this is advancing forward. Okay. And this is back. And don't point at the screen. Point at the back. Does it have a pointer? Yeah, it does. Yeah, you can so do I that can with use this. that. So you can use that, but if you want to advance, you're probably going to be out that. Yeah. And then we're going to let you just do this. Works. Hi everyone. 
I'm Liz Farrell, Artistic Director of Painting, Drawing, and Printmaking and our Artist in Residence program. Welcome to Anderson Ranch's Visiting Critic Lecture with Letitia Bajuya. I want to welcome our virtual participants watching tonight as well. Before we begin, please silence your cell phones. And to begin, Anderson Ranch would like to acknowledge that our campus resides on the traditional ancestral territory of the Ute people. We've called the Roaring Fork Valley and beyond home for over 800 years. It's an honor to introduce Letitia Bajuyo. This past summer, she taught a sculpture course entitled Fabricating Landscapes, during which students engaged in a series of conceptually guided projects that utilize the welding shop, wood shop, and digital lab. Currently based in Oklahoma, Letitia is an assistant professor at the University of Oklahoma. A Philippinex American interdisciplinary artist and object maker based in Oklahoma, Letitia creates drawings, sculptures, and installations that highlight the impact of her desire. Her interest in unpacking value perceptions find their roots in her autobiography, Growing Up Biracial, in a small town named Metropolis on the border of Illinois and Kentucky. The time and space of quiet landscapes outside and the multinational dialogues inside her family's home influence the development of her critiques of consumer capitalism. Fickle her studio practice, Letitia seeks community and welcomes collaboration by participating in artist collectives, including the Philippinex Artists of Houston, Land Report Collective, and Project Vortex. So please join me in welcoming Letitia. Oh, there's the mic. Sorry, bad me. Yes. So, again, thanking everybody here and for welcoming me back. Um, it's been definitely a pleasure to get to visit the studios today to see all the amazing things that you already have been doing and how Anderson Ranch has been adding to that component. Within my own artwork, I just this is a screenshot of my website. Sometimes I, I joke that you could look at my website, you think there's probably 10 different artists that made that work. I, I love and I generate opportunities in my own work and for others, and it's something that really drives me. I didn't know this is what I was gonna do at all, but ever since I found that path, it's been like there's been a continual fire, and being able to be a part of your all's fire as you're here just adds that much more to my own. So. As Liz noted, as far as where does it start, I always love a good story. And as we've been meeting today and then we we'll continue tomorrow, the first thing I'm always offering and finding out is what's, what brought this on? Where are you from? What do you do? What's been your story? Because if not, um, Sean and I were talking about this earlier, the difference between space and place. Right? So all of a sudden it has a story. And so what's my story? So this is my brothers and I. These are my two little brothers. There's me. I'm waiting for the... I'm in first grade, they're in kindergarten, and we're waiting for the bus. This is what our landscape looked like. This, this is three acres from the house. We lived way out in the country. And this is my mom and dad back when they were younger. Uh, my dad is Filipino uh, Chinese. He moved to the US in his late 60s. And my mom was a nurse at the same hospital that he was the new resident surgeon. And my uncle was the anesthesiologist and he played matchmaker with, right, with his new surgeon and his baby sister, and then later you have me. But I, I find their story to be a complicated one because they weren't necessarily, they weren't trained in their individual cultures about having a, a relationship with someone from another place. And so we, in many ways, were a testing ground. They didn't necessarily have the language or the dialogue to be able to prepare themselves for having kids in the U.S. who don't necessarily understand everything else that from their individual cultures. And so that's where this dialogue in my own work about searching, searching for 
for place, searching for belonging, searching for how do you, how do you navigate these cultural capital of, of existence and find peace. And that was something I found myself early on searching for, even when I was little, um, trying to make sense out of this world that I was in. I remember when I was in the, I think it was the fourth grade, and I learned that there's this thing called slumber parties. There's a what? And then only, I was like, but that means they've been going on. And I wasn't invited, you know, so it was like, you know, like the, that like dawning, like ideas. But in my, for my dad, that wasn't something that was done. Only if need, you spend the night at someone else's house if you needed it, right? If your family was in a desperate moment. And so this idea of going out and doing that was, was, not, un, was not usual. So it was a dialogue of helping him understand and helping my mom understand his view, like, that was part of who I was growing up, and I find I still do that today. I do that with my materials, I do that with my students, and that doesn't mean it's easy, and that doesn't mean that I have made all full sense out of all of these moments, but I fully recognize I was doing this back then. And this is the landscape that I grew up seeing. My pointer's not working. Oh, there it is, it's kind of faint, never mind. So the, this kind of landscape, I could never quite call front seat fast enough, back when you could sit in the front seat as a kid, it was before car seats. And so I would just stare out the back window, the third seat in the van, uh, and watch these houses pass by, and this landscape, and it was like flat, flat, flat silo, flat, 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 flat bale of hay, flat, flat, flat cow. And, but there's pauses, and then the joy of something coming up, I recognize that kind of pacing and sort of sensitivity continues to be a part of my work. Something else about this kind of landscape was that whenever I would pass by someone else's house and you see that light in their house, I remember so desperately always wondering, like, do they even realize I'm thinking about them? We're passing by their house. Do they even see this car? And then I'd flip it around. I was like, how many people have passed by my house that I didn't even think about? What was going on, on inside their car? Were they fighting? Were they happy? Right? And so it was like, I'm like little, and I'm like having all these thoughts about other people's vantage points. And that's something that I try to do continually is how do we step into someone else's shoes to empathize? Other things that generate my work, that town metropolis, the word metropolis is a Greek word for big city. They named this little town in southern Illinois, which is on the river of the Ohio River, south, like you continue on down, up river is like Cincinnati and Pittsburgh. They thought it was going to be the next big place because of river transportation. Named it Metropolis, jinxed it for life. Never got past 7,000 people. But in the 20th century, when the comic book and the movies, all those things came out, they were the only Metropolis on the map. And so they adopted it. There's the statue, is the statue in the middle of the town. This is the only statue in town. And it's 25 foot tall. Superman, they even do the little, like, they, get, they had a funeral when the comic book killed them off for a while, but then they brought it back. There's a parade in the summers, and there's a Superman celebration, all of the things. You make do with what you have. What do you have around you? You don't bemoan it, you lift it up. So they even have, like, the newspapers, the planet. Not, yeah, really, not the daily planet. But not necessarily for copyright, but the town's so small, it only comes out once a week on Wednesdays. So they can't be the Daily Planet. But then, you know, like, how do you take what is yours and lift it up? And then this gentleman right here, this is Craig Rhodes, Mr. Rhodes. He was my high school art teacher. He's now retired. This is one of his recent pieces. He continues to make work. He has his MFA in ceramics, and he chose to teach in high school. And he even said specifically that he wanted to make a bigger difference for the next generation. And myself and all the people who've come out of his classes can attest he did that. He made that kind of difference. So I think sometimes when we view what is success, what am I after with my work, there's different understandings of what success is. And so not to always assume that the one that everybody else has deemed, that's the right success. What's your success? And how is it that you want to continue to push that? He helped me see that. He was not only an art teacher, he was also my academic. I was on the academic team where you push the little button and answer the question real fast. So I was on that. He was our coach for that. And so it, would, it helped me also see that art didn't have to only stay in the classroom. It could expand. And I remember we were like in drawing class and I was drawing. He would play NPR, all things considered. I didn't know that there was this thing called NPR back then, right? Especially in like two hours north of Nashville, Tennessee. 
listening to these other stories while drawing is something I still do in my work. So when I make art, I still listen to those stories. I still tune in. I still make sure that that additional reach is a way that I can include that in my work. And so he generated a lot of movement. So jumping forward, this is my uh, graduate thesis show. I did my undergrad at University of uh, Notre Dame in northern Indiana. And studied everything. And I started off, my parents were really hoping biochem. Yes. And I said, no. Um, and I kept finding my way over to the art program. And I ended up majoring in painting and drawing. But something was missing. I don't know if you've ever felt that. Like something's missing. I, there's something else I'm trying to do. And I couldn't quite figure it out. I could do it in my philosophy classes and my like history courses, I was even taking MBA classes. Like I was interested in everything and I would get to my art class and if the professor didn't put the thing in front of me and tell me what to do, I was frozen. Because I was so used to like, meeting expectations. How do I set my own expectations? And so I had to take one more class that I put off until my senior year of undergrad and that was sculpture. I took that sculpture class my fall semester, my senior year, and it was like a light opened up, and all of a sudden this idea of metaphor, like what you could do, I didn't have to always draw the apple, I could just actually use the apple. Is it the real apple, or do I cast the apple in bronze? Do I make an apple in resin? All of a sudden I was like, oh, I can work with that. Right? I could have a story, I could have a dialogue with these objects that I didn't narrate and tell an audience member exactly how to see it, but I could open up an opportunity. And since then, that was 1998, and I have been running on that same energy ever since. I love what I get to do. And if I lost my day job tomorrow, I would still do it. I would just find another avenue to do it because this is something I believe in. This is my thesis show. I made so many different things when I was in graduate school, and it was actually, at the time I was a practicing Catholic, and I, it was at mass at Ash Wednesday, and the priest at the time, he described the history of Ash Wednesday and the correlation with the invention of soap. And as he goes on and describes this, I stopped listening to whatever he was saying. I was someplace else. And I was just thinking about like this need to wash off and how so many things tell us we are not enough. It's like, I want to make my thesis work about that dialogue. And so whether it's shampoo that tells us that's going, going to make your hair bouncy and, and like shiny and everything. Who says, right? I, I read all the backs of the things like, oh, this is going to work. Why? There's so much faith in those, like, these little stories. Or same thing within religion or within education, this indoctrination. Insurance ads tell us we are not enough. Fear, fear, fear match what we want. And if they were actually successful, if self-help books were actually successful, it would stop. That would be no more. And that's what my thesis was about. That's what all the writing and all the research I did was about this type of cultural capital push to convince us that we need something more. And that what this piece is, is a series of resin cast sinks um, that have bronze cast soap holders and handmade soap that are then carved with words. My favorite one was apathy. Nobody washed with that one. Um, and as you would wash with them, the sinks would darken, the water would get soiled, and then the halos underneath would start to vanish. So it was a performance piece, um, it was a theatrical setup as far as the way that the lighting and the um, setting would work. And all of the soaps were scented with rose oil so the space would change as you would actually use them. And so it's titled Daily Soaps because of thinking like a soap opera, a daily soap opera always has a cliffhanger at the end. Like you're trying to get to the thing and then you have to tune in the next day, same idea you need more. The other thing that I channel within this is in the Philippines, the issue of colorism, being too dark, fearing getting darker was a negative. It was seen as being unattractive. And so I would be very worried about my skin being out in the sun too much. In the Philippines, there's a lot of soaps and lotions that will whiten your skin. And so I was still, I was bringing in that idea, like what is it that we're wanting to wash off? And that my, my thesis in the end was about Choosing, even whether or not you wash, but choosing, I, need, I should be washing off my apathy. I should be washing off my conceit. I should be, all of these smaller, not big sins, but these smaller things that are actually what I'm after, just making that acknowledgement was more powerful than any of those other things, trying to convince me that I needed to buy that shampoo to make myself more attractive. What is it that I'm trying to get rid of? And so that's what this thesis show was doing 
as people would wash. And then as they would wash, the bronze would patina itself. And so it's all raw bronze, it's not sealed, and so that way it would start to patina as it was used, documenting the use, documenting what it was helping. So I love that piece still. I have one left. I've, I've kept one out of the 10 um, as far as pieces of those. That Every so often I'll, I'll pull it out because somebody will ask to show it, but it's like hard for me to, like, because I don't want anything to happen to that last one. Um, Jumping forward, something I've been thinking a lot about when I was thinking about this talk is about teams. All of the people that involve, it's not necessarily always the direct team, but to get to those pieces, the number of faculty members, colleagues, peers that were involved to make those, those shows happen. This is the very first CD sculpture. If there's anything I'm probably the most visibly known for of my work are my CD sculptures. I love making these. They are so much fun to design and to build. This is the very first one. I did not know this was in my repertoire. I didn't know this was coming. It was all thanks to a curator named Jay Jordan. He was in Louisville, Kentucky at the time, and Paula Katz, who's in Indianapolis. And they were the first show that I didn't apply to. They came in, I got a studio visit from Jay, and he was like, will you be my artist? I have to pick one artist. Paula Cass has asked me to choose somebody. Would you be my artist? I was like, okay. What does this mean? <laughs> he was like, you get a 30 foot by 30 foot by 30 foot space. You have this much time. You have this much money. Make something. <gasps> Right, it was like a dream. At the same time, I'm like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? Because everything else up until then, this is 2009, that last piece was 2001. I'd always made sculpture and then applied. I don't know if that, you know, as far as like, here's my idea, this is what I'm gonna do. This was the first time I ever got something the other way around, and it was mind boggling to me. And so, I, at the time I was making these awful water bottle sculptures in my basement, and I kept making water bottle sculptures. And then Nazreen Shannonpour, she was one of the, my colleagues. I was teaching at this small liberal arts college called Hanover College in Indiana. And she brings me water bottles for my sculpture and a box of CDs. And she's like, I don't know if you could use these or not, but you can't recycle them. And the only place you can recycle them is in Terre Haute, Indiana. And I'm like, in my head, I'm like, why Terre Haute, Indiana? And then I was like, Sure, my favorite price is free, just so you all know. So I love free objects. And then, so, so I have these, I go back to the ugly water bottle sculpture that I'm making, because I had a grant from the Fe Rivers Foundation. So I was trying to do this thing, and it's not working. And these shiny CDs are like sitting in my studio. I don't know if you've ever done this before. There's a thing, right, with new material. I look over, I'm like, so I pull those in, I was like, what do you mean? So finally I give in, I start researching the CD. And I find out why Terre Haute, Indiana? Because Sony is based in Terre Haute, Indiana. They're the US headquarters. It's the first place in the US that ever pressed a CD. Second place in the world, first being Japan, where Sony's primary headquarters is. I'm like, oh. right. So all of a sudden, things are making sense. How they were made when they hit peak CD, and the most of them were ever produced in the world, and then as it was coming down. And I started thinking about it, I was like, the CD is still doing its job. It's still memorizing. It's part of globalization, the desire to share information and send it someplace else. I was like, oh, I can work with that. And so what I basically make are large quilt tapestries out of CDs, out of old memories. Nobody taught me how to make anything out of a CD. Those of you who are inventing new ways, trying something out for the first time, that is one of my favorite moments where you're after something. You're trying to figure out how. And so this was in my studio at the time. And so I built all of the frames. I couldn't attach to the ceiling. I couldn't drill into the floor. And so I was like, how am I gonna make this thing? And so this was my practice one to get to that final one. And this is one later on. This is in Indianapolis also in 2016 after I've at this point perfected the way that I like to stitch CDs together. And the way that those go up is something like this. It was eight days on site, nine months in planning. But it all started with an accident with Nazrin Shanampur bringing a box of CDs, but also with Jay Jordan and Paula Katz opening up an opportunity. I couldn't touch their walls. Their walls were this brushed aluminum, but I wanted to make it look like it was vast behind there. So it's a curved plywood stud wall, and it was invented so that way um, each of the columns, the ceiling on that space, the ceiling on that space sloped. So there's a slope here, which was not the same slope as down here. And so I had to be able to articulate each of those studs that go up. So 
I love problem solving, finding ways to make something work, how to be able to make this happen. And then once it got up, the, the, I recognized I also wanted it to change. And so the, thanks to um, a light company, we've also installed, installed in it um, color changing lights that were computer controlled to change every eight, like they would go through a cycle in eight minutes. So as you're walking by, if you're walking by fast, you wouldn't notice anything. But if you're slow, it would change. And all of a sudden it would start to like play in a way that was different. I'm basically painting, and so I use the CDs and I make a palette of all of the CDs in which the purple ones are DVDs, burnable DVDs. I separate those out, I separate all the color ones out, and that's my palette whenever I make these. Other ones I've done, so this is my team. Um, I, people, there's so many people that make these things possible. I can't do these things alone. And so, thanks to Volker Eisel, he's the one who's the curator for in Houston, Sculpture Month Houston. He um, invited me to create an installation for Sculpture Month in the silos. Those of you who've ever been to Houston may recognize the Success Rice silos. We were inside there. Here's two of my graduate students at the time. This is Manami and this is Clarissa. Manami's now a professor over in Kenyan College. Uh, and they were just rock stars, so they helped me build one of these inside the silos. So I asked for three silos, and you can see it even matches like the funnel where the rice used to come down. And it's a round space and a very narrow space. So riding that scissor lift up and down, up and down, up and down for weeks to be able to install this space, to transform the space into something that felt out of this world. It's titled Event Horizon. And Event Horizon is the point of no return. I'm a big Star Trek fan. Any other Trekkies? Got one, yeah, Emil! Um, I love Star Trek. An event horizon is what they describe in, in a black hole, but it could also be any whirlpool, any tornado, any, any kind of system like that, where at some point you can't escape. In this, if the black hole, the gravity is too strong, it's gonna pull you in. So I think about choices, choices that bring us closer and closer where you have a no, point of no return and you have to make a no, new decision. Other things that have happened with these, um, at one point in time I was at the West Street Art Center using their space as a studio, and I wanted, I had this opportunity to do a suspended one of these with horns, and I kept thinking if I put these two hula hoops on each side, I would attach them to that. I have a whole series of pieces made only out of hula hoops. I make all of my own hula hoops out of irrigation tubing. And so I was like trying to get this thing to work. And it kept collapsing and I couldn't figure it out. And this other artist named Paul Hosferter comes in one day into this shared space. One of the benefits of shared space is he was like, looks at me for a little while. I was like, why don't you just do it vertically? Oh, <gasps> what? Oh my God, that's so brilliant. And this is to this day the way I still build these. And so I hang one hula hoop at the top and I basically make a chandelier, attach the second one, and then I basket weave all of these together to basically make a tube that I can carry around. And then when I get to the site, I suspend the, these are, this is a basket and this is a basket and this is a basket. I then I blend in in between with smaller strands of CDs until I make the larger piece. And when I'm allowed to, I like to include theremin, so that way they're interactive, and you can interact with the theremin and the sound comes out in the CDs. These unwanted CDs are now the transfers for new sound. when you walk around them, you see all these memories. You're like, oh, I had that DVD. Oh, I hated that song. Oh, that was my favorite you know, album. You know, all these other analog memories from the outside that are then layered with the inside, which is where all the shiny part happens. I haven't made a CD installation since COVID. I, tried, I did one during COVID. It was really hard to do. It took like three times longer to build because I could only have two studio assistants in the, in the gallery at a time and everybody had to be masked. And so I was like, I'm gonna take a hiatus from these for a little while. I've maxed out, the most I could do in a year of those was about three, because they're just physically tasking to do and they take weeks and weeks to prep, uh, months to design. Um, but one of the groups that Liz mentioned that I love being a part of is Project Vortex. Project Vortex is 
was started by Aurora Robeson, who's making one of her pieces right here. And it's a collective, an international and national collective of artists that work with only pl recycled plastic. And our upcoming show is in Chelsea at the School of Visual Arts. And so if you are in New York, please come and hang out. I'll be installing for about a week. And so that's my, I'm coming back with one more a CD sculpture for them. And so I've been designing that one. It's probably gonna have two walls with two vortexes that you can walk in between. But this is such a wonderful organization to be a part of and group. And anytime that we sell pieces from the website, they get donated to selected organizations. And whenever I build any of those large sculptures, I always break thousands of discs. They, all it takes is me dropping one of those CD strands or pressing too hard. I keep all of the broken ones because they too have memory. Just because they can't be used in the same way doesn't mean that they don't still have value. So I hold on to those and I make these sculptural visual poems. This one's titled, You Can't Hurry Love. I had this album that the song, You Can't Hurry Love was on the label. And so it's the staircase leading up to it. And so I build, I, Sometimes use just adhesive. Other times I, I also have a plastic welder that I use for building these. And so to be able to design these just brings so much joy. I don't have to have any engineers check out my work. I can just build it on my own. I don't have to have a team for once. Um, and so these are little pleasures to get to build. Another collective that I wanted to share with you all, because I think about now that I've been doing this work, I continue to seek out other groups to challenge me more. At a certain point, we don't always get the same challenge from other people. They just might pat you on the back, oh, great review, you get you know, like compliments, but we don't always get the same kind of feedback that we need to grow. And so for me, collectives like Project Vortex challenge me. So in my phone calls and hanging out with Aurora, like it will help me grow and seek out another dialogue within those pieces. But I also have a whole series of pieces made out of AstroTurf. It's one of my other like sort of like hoarding problems is artificial grass. I work with companies, I don't buy it. I work with companies that all of their remnants after they install, I get the scraps. And then I design pieces out of those. So I work with Land Report Collective. We have seven artists right now, and we've been thinking about adding in a couple more. And all of us explore dialogues about land, land use, land ownership, land rights, but from different avenues. Some of the people in this group, there's a drawing artist. Shelby is known for high representational graphite and charcoal drawings, like really representational, high contrast. Brian Job is known for his installations of found objects, mostly construction materials. Patrick Highcutt, he's based in New Mexico. He's a painter, representational painter, mostly still life. And so we all bring our individual ways of working together to be able to create exhibitions that you can see these are Patrick's paintings here, here's Shelby's drawings, and then my sculptures. Oh, go back. Oh no, why is it going so fast? And so this is during COVID and during shutdown. Uh, I don't know about anybody else, but I lost exhibitions. There was lots of opportunities that had to be put on pause. And I was working really hard as a professor down at Texas A&M Corpus Christi at that time to be there for my students. Hours and hours on Zoom, trying to figure out how to change my project assignments to still be there for them, to hold space for them, to help them still get the undergraduate experience that they deserved, that it wasn't their fault that this virus was spreading across the country. And I recognized I stopped making art and I was feeling so much stress. And we had a land report call because one of our shows got paused and Jason Brown, he's one of our members, he's also a sculptor, he challenged the group. He's like, I'm doing all these online exhibitions for my graduate students, why don't we do one? We're like, yeah, let's do one. So we challenged each other, you have three weeks to make a new piece. And for that, that's where this drawing came out. It's an eight foot drawing that's COVID based. And so for some reason, those are on automatic move. Um, and they're each six feet apart. So I did a different kind of landscape because the landscape at that time was so it's such an internal one in 2020. So I went back to my drawing skills from undergrad and it's graphite on wood. And this is all wood that has been salvaged from a furniture store that was closing. 
It's wood that was supposed to be the backs of cabinets and the backs of dressers, but didn't get to do that. It was going to be burned. And so instead, I'm making it the landscape. And so I design, I go through, I have a, pi a pile about three feet tall still. And so I go through the pile and I look for the composition of the background that I then place the objects on top of. So that's actually just as much. So the tree was part of the drawing artist along with me, all of its history. This is the most recent land report show we just had. I brought, I put this in for Soen. This is where Soen went to high school. You rec yeah. This would have been up. I saw it. Oh, what? Nice, excellent. I didn't realize you saw. It. I knew you were going back. I just didn't realize that was what. Well, wonderful. I hope you enjoyed the show. Excellent. Good answer. <laughs> Uh, and so you can see more of those um, tapestries. It's on um, tarp. So tarp is often used, especially in places like Corpus Christi after a hurricane, as a quick repair for windows or for, for roofs to be able to hold something or cover something. It's an inexpensive way, but that material then degrades very quickly. And so I'm making that material the basis and basically the, the backing for the, the mosaics out of AstroTurf. These are Jason Brown's pieces with these reflections that come off of the, the, art, the mirrored acrylic, and he's thinking about coal mining. Here's some of Brian Job's installations of his bricks that he finds, the way that he combines brick. Ray and I were talking about his work earlier today, and so I definitely recognize the way that he's creating these monuments, but out of materials that he collects slowly and sees a resonance between them. And then this is one of my newer pieces um, that I made for this show. It's a CD tower that looks like it's springing up and is based on looking and researching landfills. I find landfills both ominous and kind of beautiful. The way that they just cover all of the things we don't want anymore with a thin layer of turf. And then there's those columns that let out all of the methane out of it. And so this is um, my sort of version of one of those. What is it that we're burying our insulation foam and then these CDs are letting out all of the methane gas. And so you can see on the side, the video work and installation and paintings. So this group continues to challenge me. It lets me have space to be able to have the discussion in my work about land and about boundaries and about where we are and where we wanna be when it comes to that component of the earth that we're on. And so, that doesn't mean that when Project Vortex works, these ideas aren't still in my head, but it allows me to really channel that idea and dig in deeper with a group of people who are also interested in that same topic. And then we apply for shows around the country and internationally. Land Report has two people in Wyoming, one in New Mexico, one in Georgia, two in Tennessee, and then myself in Oklahoma. And so when we apply for shows, we're bringing all of our unique um, investigations together. Something else, another team, I'm sharing with you all my teams. I love teams because I can't do these things, again, by myself. Um, I, I enjoy the opportunities. I always seek more and more opportunities to be able to pour sculptural metal. So, oh, can you see me? There's me. This is like 5 in the morning. We had a 4 a.m. pour. Um, we didn't finish the last tap until like after 4 a.m., so we are just about ready to clean up. This is in Indiana. It's at Sculpture Trails. This is my mold there on the left. It's a 38 part sand mold that has lots of little Cape Cod houses based off of Brancusi's um, endless column. It's then held together with threaded rod and had to be moved by crane. Here's it being poured, this is the same piece. I'm up here, so you'll see me, right? There's me. I'm charging the furnace, so I don't even get to pour my own piece, but my energy's still in it. So it takes this whole team to get this piece to become an element, an entity. And that's what it looked like when it first came out. Cut off all the gating, and here's where we are now. And so now I'm working on cleaning it up in patina and getting it to be, this is the kind of surface that it'll turn into. This is another piece from that same series. And so it gets painted. Um, and then rusted through, so it looks like it's this excavation that we keep changing over the houses. It gets remodeled and remodeled. What's below that surface? And so the, if it wasn't for sculpture trails, I couldn't pour that. Our furnace at University of Oklahoma, I can't pour that much at a time. And so I was able to get these pieces done at sculpture trails. University of Oklahoma, I've been there for all of a year and a half. I'm in my second year there. As mentioned, I'm from here, so I was born and raised here on this border. 
I did my undergrad up at Notre Dame. This is for Georgie, because I know we were talking about where's like locations. Uh, and then I went to grad school in Tennessee. I became a professor in 2001, and I was there at Hanover College until 2016. And then I went back up to Notre Dame and taught there for about a year and a half. And then I moved all the way down to Corpus Christi, Texas, where I taught for five years. And now I'm in Oklahoma. And so you'll see there's this, uh, this like focus on the Midwest. I will ever, forever cheer for the underdog, the part that's left behind, the people who are left out. That's where I find I'm drawn to. And I look for dialogues in those spaces. And so I, I feel that art can be and needs to be everywhere. And so how can I make sure that any space I'm in, no matter where I'm at, I can still try to reach out, ask for help, create opportunity around me. Oh, one way that I'm creating opportunity that makes me so excited. If you would like to follow us at um, their sculpture program, this is at OU Sculpture. Um, it's our Instagram page. These are all of my students. And so right now we are in a show. So I'm always looking for things to do as if I didn't have enough to do. I'm always looking for more things to do. So I reached out to Cassidy Fry, who is the assistant professor in, in sculpture over at Tex Tulsa Community College, and, and inquired, would it be possible to have a show? Because I recognize, what do my students need? They need something that's not about the grade. Sometimes we're so grade focused or just focused on like trying to complete this thing in a project that what's this next life? And so helping them see their work in a space that's outside of the classroom, outside of even our campus gallery. And so I, it's myself, my colleagues in sculpture, and the graduate students in sculpture, and then, all of, and then I, I curated into it, um, or we curated into it. I worked with my team, and we picked out, I believe it's 14 undergrads that are being featured. And so here's some of their installations in that space. And there's, and next we're heading to Northwestern Oklahoma State University. I think that program might be some of our folks online. Uh, thanks to Tom Cornell. Tom is the professor up there who's invited us to come and exhibit. And Emma, one of my grad students, is going to do a workshop in glass and glass, glass fusing. And so trying to create ways that we can continue to grow. And so for that show, it's going to be alumni, some recent, um, some alumni from University of Oklahoma faculty and our graduate students. So I'm always looking for ways to be able to bring in more people. Here's another collective. I collect collectives. Enid, Enid was the first, Enid Yandel was the first female sculptor to be recognized by the National Sculpture Society. And she, uh, we have an organization that's based on her work. And I've been showing my small player piano poems and drawings with them. And then this is an archive that I started. How to, again, create opportunity. I only got to where I am because other people made offers, invited me in. And so how can I do that for somebody else? How can I create more opportunity and more connection? And so started this with a friend of mine. Her name's Sabine Senth. She's down in Texas. And we each got 12. So I got 12 and she got 12, one including ourselves. And we could invite a few people and then they invited people. It's like a chain mail for 24 hours of wonder. The charge is a 12 inch piece, a circle that we would then install. And every time we show, we add another half day and another half day. So now we're up to 36 artists and it continues to grow. This is when it was installed in Arkansas. The first installation was in Berlin. And most of the artists I don't know, but I get to know them through it. And all of our work gets to be together. I'm not the smartest sometimes. I created an archive that I collect and I keep showing those objects. So it keeps taking up more space in my studio. Do you have time for one more story? Oh, yeah. Cool. <laughs> All right, so oh, wait, maybe two more stories. Um, so this one, this was um, just last year. I love this piece so much. Um, it's titled Swing Set, Share, Share. Duyan Igbahani Ang Balato. And so it is in just north of Houston in Splendora. And when I went out there for this opportunity, I was asked to install. I was walking with James Searles. This is his property, uh, walking out into the woods. And it's about a half mile walk. And it was summer in Houston. It was hot. And I got all the way out there. And all I wanted to do was sit down somewhere. But all the benches had like ivy and things. I was scared. I thought I was going to get bit by a spider. I was like, I just really want to sit. And so that's where the idea started was to make a swing set that held 20 people. 
um, that would spin around. I was also at the same time doing research for this other piece, I'll show you in a second, um, on roundabouts. And so with roundabouts, you have to pay attention to the other people around you. You can't just plow through. And so the whole point of roundabout, I know so many people who hate roundabouts, but you have to like make eye contact and you have to see them to make sure it's your turn to go. And so thinking about that with this swing set, you, ha you, can, you can't just like go willy nilly when you swing because you're gonna kick somebody in the butt or you're gonna get kicked in the butt. And so it's about a communication, about conversation. And this is what it looks like now. I love making this and designing it. Um, it's all, it's welded steel, but it had to be also, um, I had to make sure that I could carry it out because it's far enough out and when it rains, the ground's too soft, you couldn't drive. So it needed to be something light enough and compartmentalized enough that I could carry it out on like a wheelbarrow if I had to. And so all of these all come apart in four foot pieces and then they go together on site. These parts in the middle are, are welded to look like a Gothic cathedral mashed up with uh, the swing set on the outside. But they're all just like swing sets you would just buy. Um, so it's, it's mostly swing sets that have been like bought and put together, except the center was made to be able to do this, but merged together. All of the swings are extra special. And so I was like, I can make all the swing sets, but part of this is about sharing. How do we share? How do we share story? How could this piece be an opportunity for more discussion, for more people to share their work? And I reached out to that community that I'm also a part of, the Philippinex Artists of Houston, and I invited them. I was like, would you be interested to be part of my team for this? And I went down to Houston, brought all the seats, and taught some woodworking workshops. Some of them had never touched wood. They were culinary artists. Philippine Next Artists of Houston includes culinary, it includes musical artists, it includes photographers, videographers, visual artists, poets, and some of them had never thought about working in wood, and so this was their first opportunity, and they loved learning and sharing their story and finding ways to be able to make it their own. So this is a, our first workshop. And then on my Instagram, as well as on my website, continue to share their story. And so making sure to give each of them some space to be able to amplify what it is that they're about, who they are. And on top of that, James Earls had an extra push. He's like, on top of that, we're gonna have a celebration um, for last, it was last year, it was for his 80th birthday combined with the celebration of sculpture out on the property. And we were required to have some kind of performance. It could be song, it could be dance, it could be poetry. And so I remember brainstorming with my team. I was like, what could we, I was like, what do we wanna do? And we recognized the shape of the sculpture looks like a spider. And we started brainstorming that spider. The spider story in the Philippines is um, about this young girl named Gamba. And Gamba was um, maybe not the best child. Like she wasn't always paying attention, wasn't always doing what she was supposed to do, and was a really good weaver. And so the, as the fairy tale goes, like any other fairy tale, whether it's Hansel and Gretel or such that tells you not to go off the woods by yourself, and this one about behaving. And so kids were told this story to threaten. So it's a story of trauma in many ways. And she gets turned into a spider, the first spider, which is why the spider, the word for spider is Gagamba. And so working with a team of artists, especially Mary Lou Carrera, who is a body and performance artist based in Chicago, Mary Lou Mariko Carrera choreographed and wrote the story. And then we worked with other performers in Houston, and this is what they created. So Mary Lou is basically Gamba, who just woke up as a spider, but not knowing that she's a spider. And then in the woods are also these woodland sprites who find this sculpture and are playing. The woodland sprites start to teach Gamba how to be part of the nature, how to find out what her body can do. And as a weaver, she has her own skills, so she figures out how to share, which she couldn't do when she was a child. What? <laughs> 
in the Philippines. There's also a type of martial arts called Kali, which uses sticks. It looks like a dance. It was a way that the Filipinos would hide their martial arts. So she teaches them how to do this type of weaving to teach the woodland sprites how to protect themselves. <laughs> and then they commemorate the sculpture. Oh, I love it! And this is the sculpture with 20 butts. You should get on the, okay. on the I'm following her. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad. Yeah, I'm glad because I don't get much pictures of me anyway. I'm going to the pieces before we go to the eye. And so we're going to be a little baby swing. First time I see it. There's our crew. This couldn't happen without all these people. Sharing, creativity, problem solving, working, committing time. And so all of the things I, I've been able to do is not solo. We come as a team. And so how is it that we can make sure that we recognize all of those other people who continue to be a part of that? We say thank you. And so this is my thank you. And one more. This is the last one, I promise. Um, so this is one of the things I'm working on right now. It's been in process for a while. Alicia Eggert, who's been here before, one of your teachers, she and I are working on these two roundabouts. We were selected thanks to Iris Bechtal. She's our curator in common and with the Fort Worth Public Art Program. And so if all works out, this should be up later this year or early next year. And so we have two roundabouts. Our charge was that the two had to be conceptually linked, but not the same. And so as you drive around one, they link to the other. Hers is titled A Very Long Now. It's 60, like 60 seconds on a minute, 60 nows. But they all say now. They say now at the top and they say now at the bottom. Everything in between is a mashup of the word as it transforms and shifts. Mine is titled one way, taking the imagery of the one way of the, of the signs, I've then flipped it into a doily, um, almost like a lollipop. Um, but I was thinking of it as like these like sort of signals. And it goes through from blue to green, blue skies and green grass, that there's something that we keep looking for that's, again, like that I was saying earlier, looking for something more. Somebody has greener grass, somebody has bluer skies. I'm not enough. Where I'm at is not enough. But as you drive around, it's, it's definitely demonstrating, like, no, we, where we are is enough. And so acknowledge that as we ride, drive around, it's high enough up that eight feet right here, cars and trucks can see underneath. So I didn't want to block that. But then that way up above is this symmetrical, it's um, an infinity sign from some sides. And as you drive around, it turns into a crown and then back into an infinity sign as you move around the space. So trying to lift up those moments of just doldrum as you drive from home to dropping off kids at work or go going to work, dropping off kids at school, you drive around the same thing again and again. But trying to think of like this one way that we're path, this path that we're on is a shared experience. And with that, salamat kayo. Thank you. Thank you so much, Letitia. That was amazing. Um, I want to give everybody a few moments to gather yourselves and ask ask questions. So we have some time for that before dinner. Does anyone have any questions? I'm going to bring this by and please use the microphone so that folks online can hear your question. Otherwise, they can't hear it at all. Here we go. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, really interesting to see everything together. Um, I'm kind of curious how, when you were talking about when sculpture really clicked for you, the use of metaphor, um, how that's maybe changed for you as you've kept making work and when you decide to pick up a metaphor and when certain metaphors maybe are a little too obvious or, or not quite right, like how do you make those decisions? I think, um, no, thank you so much. I, I think that for me it's shifted into a research into each material. And so often the metaphor is like, I look for what that material can do within a larger dialogue. And so it might not be an obvious, like maybe translation. And so what is it that, like the CD, what's its history and how can I use it? And so it might not be a direct metaphor anymore as it was when I was younger. Um, but where I, I look for 
what each material is able to start to generate and how I can either transition that, alter it, or add to it. Um, and so like this, that there's no found objects in this one, but the found object was that sign, that sign that tells us which way to go. And so how can I pull that in, but then transform it to make it something different, something more than it usually gets to be. But it's definitely grown from being maybe a, a literal metaphor. Um, thank you for your talk. It was really nice hearing all the context and stories about each of your pieces and how they come about. Um, I'm interested in the stories of your pieces after it goes through a show or a, an exhibition. Um, do you have spe like specific um, approaches or thoughts towards how your pieces live through after a public view? Mm -hmm. Really good question. Sometimes I'm like, why wasn't I not smarter and I didn't become like a 2D artist? because that would be easier. So for some pieces, they stay. So like Duyan is there for two years, and so it's, I don't have to worry about it yet. But it's coming. Um, backing up. So smaller objects, those usually just go into, like if they're not purchased right away or if they continue to exhibit, they stay in their crates. You just inspect them once in a while. but like getting to the CDs. So this is probably the hardest one, is what do you do with all of those in between? I have an ample collection of those that keep coming in, and so they'll show up in my mailbox. So same thing, everybody, if you happen to go home and your neighbor's like throwing out their CDs, I will continue to add, um, because I recognize like there, there's only a limited number. Um, but I also like it when it's a personal donation, because then there's all the other stories that come with it that I can weave in, but I have boxes and boxes and boxes of new donations that I then segregate by color and type, prepping my, my, my uh, palette. And then after the show comes down, I take all of them apart. So all of these, the cable ties get cut and I have a bin of cable ties that have used their life that I find ways, I look for ways to be able to make those into other sculptures. And then with the CDs, I fold those up they fold up pretty well the way that they're tied and then they go in bins according to size. And so if there are three CDs tied together, four CDs tied together, or five CDs tied together, they're the shorties. And so there's a bin of shorties and then there's a bin of mediums, which isn't the best word, but I didn't have a better word. And so it's like, those are six CDs long up to like eight and then nine up to 12. And so I, they're all in their separate bins if, they've, if they're still in good condition. If they're broken, they go into the first aid box and so whenever I have a new studio assistant, their first job is they get the first aid box and they have to fix them. So they learn how to handle them by fixing them and then they get put into shorties, mediums, or longs. And then, then there's the color ones that are separate, like the purples and blues, they get their own box of just like theirs. Yeah. And then all of those are stored in my studio and in my garage and in the attic and they, they go everywhere. So that way whenever it's time that they come back out. Um, I also have a bin of only hula hoops that I've made that I use as the structure now. Um, and so that's probably like, there's definitely some hoarding. The line between a sculptor and a hoarder, tiny, very tiny. <laughs> um, but does that get to where you're thinking? The benefit of outdoor sculptures is that they can stay outside. So I have yeah, other outdoor ones that just get to live in the yard. Letitia, oh. Oh, we had one more. We have a question here. And then I have yeah. I, I just, uh, I think uh, you, you, you blew my mind with all of this stuff. You know, I'm not artistic at all. I, uh, but <clears throat> I thought about how functional everything is and your, the comment you made that you look for the forgotten parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and then I was thinking about that you are, uh, you're an incredible architect. You know, you build buildings or places or things where people can be for a while. And, and <clears throat> so I'm Thank just, uh, I think that of architects, if, if some of these things could become more permanent, have you thought of that? And, and Tulsa is obviously a very surprising place. You know, people right. think about, uh, you know, the movie about the Osage and everything else that happened there. And, it could be an exciting place to do some 
uh, more permanent uh, buildings or something like that or structures yeah. that would express the forgotten, the lost, the powerful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Les. Well, I will say that there, so some of the CD pieces ha are permanent where they've been installed and they've, they've stayed. So those are great for storage. They're, you know, and they get to continue to be out, but um, not everybody has room for a CD sculpture, I fully recognize. Mm -hmm. But I will keep searching for more opportunities, plus structures. I've been working with um, a potential um, future swing set that's mm -hmm. even more stable than the one that comes apart. And so there's, there's some, yeah, but I, I appreciate your, your comments less. And I have kind of a question, comment. Um, sure. You're such an incredible leader, and this is sort of about leadership and your choices to create a community that also supports your personal um, artistic goals. And I, I can't help but think about the recent tragedy with our um, next Benedict, the non-binary child mm -hmm. near Tulsa, who was recently in, engaged in an altercation that led to, to death. And as you speak about the underdog, mm -hmm. I can't help but think right. about that. And um, I guess I want to hear more about how you choose folks to kind of raise up and to give voice to and to include in mm -hmm. your vision. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Um, no, if you haven't read or heard about that situation, that story, um, definitely pay attention and um, see if there's ways that you can either donate or fight. Um, I think our, our country right now is in such a, a unique moment of struggle, of, of trying to decide who's right, and there can't be any gray in between. And I find that all of our young people are falling, unfortunately, between those cracks. Um, and so in places like Oklahoma, where there have been some recent laws passed that have changed some things that have made it even harder for those students is to make sure that we, we try, try to create safe spaces. As far as for my leadership and how do I select people, I think it's like things like what we're doing right, right now. You all applied to be here at Anderson Ranch. You didn't know who else was applying. And the powers that be, they didn't necessarily know who that mix was going to be. And so I think what I tend to do is I, I, don't I don't have the strength and always the time to reach really far, but who in your room, who in your nexus. And so as you all are here together in this space, you're each other's team. And so how do you lift up each other? How do you create more opportunity? I've already heard some things that where people are going to bring each other in or help amplify somebody else. And so you start there for your own work. Don't feel you have to be an island. You don't have to be by yourself. But if you can find ways to be able to help others, that's the once you're once you are safe enough and you can do it, find ways to be able to reach out. And if you can do it monetarily and politically to be able to lobby, to have your voice heard, to call, to write, definitely do that because they need to find out that there's more voices out there than just the ones that are in their echo chamber. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Thank you, Letitia. Sure. All right. Um, we appreciate you being here and thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.